Final ending of the trick, other parts down below. Wife answers everything. I wandered throughout my new home's rooms. It was nearly complete. The furniture would arrive, the landscaping would be completed, and soon the decorators would be let loose. I turned to face the large home that was practically directly across from me as I gazed out over the lake. I had always told my husband that when we retired, I wanted this house, my utopia. Regretfully, he will not be residing there with me. You see, I'm not with him anymore. It was all my fault, but it didn't make the pain of his divorce from me go away. I have only ever loved him. The worst part is that he owns the large mansion across the cove. Yes, I will be relocating to his neighborhood. He's not aware of it yet. Although our granddaughter made a vow not to inform him, she does. It must come as a surprise to me. Most likely, he won't interact with me in any way. I'll be shocked if he does, but one thing I've discovered over the years is that you can never be sure how he will react to anything. The other day, on my way out of town, I drove by a cruise in, a group of vehicles that I was old enough to recall as brand new. It reminded me of so many things, particularly the time I first met Roy. The days of unrestricted love were long behind. I was pursuing a nursing degree at the time in college. I'm 300 miles away from home and nobody can reject me. Although I wasn't a virgin by any means, let's just say that I was very popular in high school and call it that. However, I went full filthy lady mode in college. I persuaded myself that I had to get it out of my system in order to return home, get married, and live a decent, modest life away from my exciting past. I had nearly finished my first year of college. I had a summer job planned up with mom at a rest home as a nurse's assistant. Excellent experience for my CV, I was afraid of it. It was a boulevard cruise. Back then, you paid 23 cents for a gallon of gas. I was with her sister Becky and her boyfriend Bobby, as well as my friends Sabrina and Jane. We were in his 1970 Chevelle, a vintage muscle vehicle. He was boasting about a bunch of things that didn't mean anything to me, like his 350 engine cam and his four on the floor. Simply put, cars were meant to get you from point A to point B. We were pulling up next to this large four-door sedan when I realized I was almost halfway through a bottle of wine. There were two guys our age in it. Bobby made fun of their car because he wanted to flaunt it. Does grandpa know you've got his car? The driver held up a 20, popped it twice, and placed it on the dash, shocking him beyond belief. This was a standard indication that he would race you for cash from one stoplight to the next. Bobby was so startled that he failed to notice the shift in brightness, and the man withdrew gradually. His laughter was audible. The next light was when we caught them. Bobby took out a 20 because he was so offended. It was not even competition. He left us behind when the light changed. Bobby was struggling to gather momentum when he pulled into a grocery store parking lot. After they had stopped, they got out and started talking about their cars, opening the hoods, and checking the engines. I stayed in the car the entire time. The driver's head was beneath the hood, so I couldn't see him. With a wink at the passenger, Sabrina said, he's kind of cute, let's get out. As we were leaving, I overheard Billy attempting to persuade the driver to let us ride along. He said, maybe we'll get some women, as I heard. Hello, I said, putting out one hand to keep my hair back and the other to introduce myself as Sheila. Woof. He flushed about eight shades of red, and I laughed with them all. I received a taste of his soon-to-be well-known sharp wit. He gave me a handshake. I'm happy to meet you, Roy. Have I mentioned to you yet how much of a dog enthusiast I am? He looked like a more refined, gorgeous John Lennon, and I liked him right away. He was about six feet tall, slim, with long hair and a beard that was not wild but well-groomed, with the most expressive brown eyes I've ever seen staring at me behind silver wire-rimmed spectacles. After a while of sitting and talking, he walked in and got me a case of beer and two bottles of my favorite wine. Even now, when I see the label for Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill, I still get queasy. While Sabrina and I worked on the wine, he and Billy had a few beers. We chatted and joked, and after 30 minutes, I was under his arm and across the seat. Common mindset at the time was, seatbelts, drinking and driving. Screw that, we were college students, we were immortal. After an hour of him massaging my leg, I decided to take up his slack, because he didn't drink much anyhow. I finished my bottle and drank what was left of Sabrina's, a bad move that left my head spinning until we got back to the apartment, where Roy actually carried me in and laid me down on the couch, where I promptly passed out. Billy and Sabrina had stopped drinking and were practically sleeping together in the back seat. After 20 minutes, Sabrina was holding my hair while I worshipped at the porcelain shrine. He walked home, realizing there was nothing more he could do for me. She gave me a big glass of water, an aspirin, and assisted me in getting into bed. They were whispering to me while I lay there, feeling the ceiling whirl. Do you believe she's asleep yet? Yes, she disappears for the night when she faints like way. Where were we, honey, right now? They never missed a stroke, so I lay there and let Billy groan and Sabrina cry out until I could bear it no more. Then I grabbed the trash can and gave up the rest of my stomach. It's a common experience for college students, waking up with a severe headache and wondering who the hell put food in your mouth while you were sleeping. Probably what woke me up was Sabrina and Billy fighting once more. 
I walked into the bathroom, drank nearly a quart of water and immediately threw it back, showered for a very long time, and then hobbled back to my bed, forgetting to put on makeup. Billy's jaw was hanging wide as Sabrina covered me with a blanket and prodded him in the ribs. Hey, how are you feeling? It seems that when I overindulge in alcohol, I always do. As bad as trash. Did I look foolish the night before? No, you were enjoying yourselves. You were having a great time, holding your halter top out of the window and telling Roy you were going to play with him. Then you rolled your eyes back and collapsed onto his lap, head down. When we got you out of the car, I saw his pants weren't fully zippered. He was an extremely irritated man. Billy laughed and I held the pillow over my head. I'll never be able to face him. I'm not going to wager on that. He gave you his phone number and said to call, perhaps you two could get together today. That day, I felt human for the first time after hearing Billy say that. Thank you, please leave so that we can get dressed. What dorm is he in, do you know? Even better, I know where his apartment is. All right. When Sabrina drives you home, I'll ride along with you guys. You could demonstrate for me. So I unexpectedly showed up at his flat. I immediately passed asleep on his couch, still reeling from the previous night. Three hours later, I woke up and had no idea where I was. Admittedly, this was not the first time that had occurred during my time in college. He was studying at the kitchen table. I felt foolish for falling back asleep, but he made me laugh, reassured me, and even took me out to dinner when I mentioned that I was hungry. It wasn't a hamburger business, rather, it was a location I had driven by numerous times without noticing. We had soup and artisan bread bowls. It was excellent. I felt like a human being again. We conversed and made out. We went to the park merely to enjoy the fresh air and sunshine. It appeared that he was well connected. The appearance of two of my friends nearly made me freak out. Not simultaneously, but I had slept with both of them, and I was worried they would say anything. I signaled to Roy that I was introducing them. Fortunately, they weren't thick, so I felt at ease. With their guitars in hand, we quickly found ourselves singing along. Roy's voice was unexpectedly good. I decided to push it since I was getting worked up from all the gentle and caressing kissing I had been performing. Back at his flat, I made him stop and get a beer. I had to go to the restroom after a few of them. I had a thought. I dashed into the shower to undress. When I opened the door and showed him my full splendor and told him he needed new towels, the sight on his face was amazing. Then I turned around, my physique was always fantastic. I smiled as I peered over my shoulder. You coming or what? I was relieved that he declined to select the option. We spent some time playing in the shower before returning to his bedroom. He was well equipped. He was slightly above average, and he had a decent thickness, according to my little expertise. However, the key distinction was in how he applied it. I was corrected in my belief that the proverb it's not the size of the wand but the magic in it was meaningless. It dawned on me what authors discuss when they write about afterglow. Late that night, he eventually brought me back to the dorm, and Sabrina took one look at him and smiled. Was he good? I gave her a direct glance. The best I've ever had. I think I'm going to marry him. She gave me a startled expression. Sure shot Sheila. Marriage. Love. What alien race do you come from and what have you done with my horny little friend? I scowled. Guys realized they would definitely get some if they could get me high enough, which is how the term originated. Roy never heard it, I hoped. Those days are over, girl, at least until I'm sure. My god, you're serious. I'm going to check this guy out. If he's as good as you say, I might take a shot. We did investigate him. Scholarship recipient from a home with a single parent's lower income. Worked nearly a full-time job and kept her grade point average close to a 4. IQ very close to genius level. Having a pal who works part-time at the admissions office is an excellent thing. Throughout the months we spent together that first year, he of course told me everything, and I never revealed to him that I already knew. By the end of the semester, I had talked my way into his apartment and we had four weeks together before I had to leave for home. He intended to remain at his job and put in as many hours as possible. That way I can cut back next year and spend more time with you. There is no disagreement there. I got a job as a nursing assistant at a rest home thanks to my mom's skillful negotiation. Despite the fact that it was a great work experience for my major, I detested it. The elderly should be respected, I know that, but it's difficult when you have to change their diaper for the third time in two hours as they scold you angrily. After taking whatever I could, I quit my work and returned to our flat. When Roy returned home, I was seated on the couch. As we made our way to the bedroom, I said to him, I didn't want to waste any time. Before I blew it all, I lived with him for the remainder of my time in college and for an additional year. I knew that we would get married, start a family, and live a lifetime together. I simply didn't want to do it at that moment. I was taken aback when he made the proposal. It was there, the final shred of my childhood being shaved away. He didn't react kindly to my response. Our partnership developed a fissure that continued growing. I was primarily to blame. A good doctor was a cunning man, but he also had good seduction skills. He paid attention as the nurses conversed, figuring out who the easiest targets were. He stroked my ego and vanity while feigning to be on my side. He suggested that I move out for a bit, scare him, let him be miserable for a month or two and then consent to move back in. 
He'll be so grateful you'll have all the power in the relationship. Then you can determine the pace. He had no idea how Roy thought and didn't know him. Had he done so, he could have ceased. I fled and hid as a result. Naturally, after a month, the physician gave me some drinks and soon after that, he beat on me and directed my heels at the ceiling. He simply got in and got out, showed no expertise, and showed no regard for my sentiments. And there was no hugging. I had to return to the wife before her suspicions mounted. I felt like a nasty woman even more because he was married. Before I told him to stop, we went to bed one more time. He was not at all bothered by it. He had achieved his goal. At work, he began making fun of me and making fun of me for no reason in front of the other nurses. I lost my temper and pulled him into a vacant room. I gave him the slap of his life. Try that one more time and I'm going straight to the administrator and file harassment complaints against you. I'll even tell them about our little meetings. It won't hurt me much, I'm a single, innocent little nurse right out of college. They won't get rid of me because I have a year left on my contract. You, however, will be in deep crap with the hospital and the wife. Think about it. A few months later, he was gone. Before leaving, I don't think he said anything else to me. For about a month, I sat and stewed, trying to think of a way to make amends with Roy. In the end, Sabrina had to pull me to a club in order to get me to leave the flat. She didn't feel any pity for me, but she still loved me like a sister. What the hell were you thinking? You'll never find anyone better than him for you. And I'll tell you another thing. You better do something quick. I've seen him with a little redhead. And she looks really happy. She could just as well have stabbed me in the heart. Roy, are you dating? Sulking with a lady rather than showing me love. I'll get her finished. Anyway, those were my thoughts. Arriving at the club and seeing him with that little woman did not cheer me up. She was also attractive. My mood didn't improve after that, and I lost it when she virtually screwed him on the dance floor. It was a really enjoyable scene. Roy launched into me, and the redhead just stood there grinning. And he did, letting out the final almost scream. I slept with the doctor, and he knew it. When he grates out the last, I almost passed out before he leaves. I'd tell you to go get screwed, but you already have. The environment became indistinct, pixelated patches. I have no idea how I made it home. Upon witnessing a group of strangers clearing out the apartment, I lost it and tried to compel them to replace everything. I recognized what I had lost when I finally realized he was gone, not just going. My remembrance of the period of time between when he left and when we reconciled is still hazy. After some time, I resumed dating. I never did find someone with whom I could go on two dates. Indeed, I had slept with a couple. I was a young, healthy person with wants, and doing so wasn't like betraying someone. As corny as it sounds, it was simply bonding. Not a single spark. I felt very envious of Billy and Sabrina. She had recently informed me that they were expecting their first child after getting married. I should have been the one to do it. She informed me that he had visited the hospital one Tuesday while in town. Together, we had worked ever since our graduation. Why didn't you tell me? How does he look? Did he ask about me? Why didn't you tell me? She extended her hand. Slow down. We didn't know he was here. We ran into him at that little cafe, the one with the soups and bread. He didn't ask about you, sorry. But, he promised to stop by this weekend on the way home and see our new house. We're going to have a little party, guys he hasn't seen in a while. You can come, if you behave yourself. For the remainder of the week, I was unable to focus, which is bad news for nurses. Sabrina watched out for me to make sure I didn't kill someone by accident. I changed into new clothes and did my makeup and hair around five times. I pondered what his opinion of me would be now. My shoulder grazing haircut has taken the place of my waist length hair. Even though I didn't particularly enjoy it, handling it was considerably simpler. I purposely arrived late so he could settle in. As soon as he began telling the story of bonding in a car in a parking lot of a bowling alley, I stepped outside onto the patio. As I listened, I started to question if I had ever truly known him. He raised his gaze to meet mine. He ceased giggling, and I caught Sabrina addressing him. She felt more at ease as he grinned and shook his head. I was limited to staring at him. Thirty minutes later, Sabrina drew me aside. Jesus, are you going to say hello to him, or what? You're giving everybody the creeps. At last, I had developed sufficient courage. But he approached me before I could react. Hi Sheila, I like your hair. I gave it a conscious pat. I appreciate it, does it age me? He startled me by admitting that it did, and then he softened the blow by suggesting that it might have something to do with the fact that I am older. He had also changed, his hair was much shorter and he had lost his beard, which was strange because he had never been beardless in all the years I'd known him. Still, he had a good chin, so I could get accustomed to it. I can count on both hands how many times in our whole life together he got really intoxicated, and he still had fingers left. I followed him about like a puppy when he became really drunk. He didn't even notice when I took his hand once he reached a particular level. I hadn't let go of his hand, and I hadn't planned to, but Sabrina and Billy took him back to his motel. After they left, I took him to the room, undressed him, put a glass of water on the bed stand, and moved a wastebasket close because I knew he would need it before the night was out. He did, but before he went back to sleep, I cleaned up after him and made sure he rinsed his mouth. I undressed knowing he was about to throw up. I cuddled up to him when he finally felt better. 
He spooned against my back at some point during the night, encircling me in his trademark embrace. I sobbed silently for an hour. Upon his eventual return to the living, I found myself seated on the bed. He initially tossed his head, causing a surge of agony that caused him to remain motionless until it subsided. When he opened his eyes once again, I remained in that position. Sheila, what are you doing here? Being with you, where I belong. Don't overthink it, just lie still for a time. After giving him some more medications and covering his head with a cool towel, I got up and stood there for approximately an hour, feeling his eyes on my back the entire time, and I glanced back over my shoulder. You really need to take a shower. Are you coming, or what? I was relieved that the water concealed my tears of relief when he joined me in the shower, but I caught my breath since I knew this was a big decision. I recall our final chat before he asked me to marry him again. It took months of pleading and cajoling before he finally accepted me back. You have my affection. While sleeping with the guy was a mistake, your biggest error was not being truthful about your feelings. Did you honestly believe we would get separated? He wasn't expecting an answer, and the question was rhetorical. The proverb fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me does, however, apply in this situation. No matter how far along we are in life, 5, 10, 20, or more, if you betray me once more, we're done for good. Do you get the picture? Yes, I nodded, adding in my mind that hell would freeze over before that occurred once more. Junior emerged eight months after we were married, therefore it must have been us who got me pregnant in that month. He was a challenging child who spent a lot of time unwell as a baby. I would have lost my mind if Roy hadn't been present. Shortly before he was scheduled to go for college, he eloped with his fiancée. Her pregnancy lasted five months. Despite their youth and immaturity, they were able to survive for 13 years before disintegrating. It wasn't friendly, arguments broke out over the most insignificant things, and accusations were hurled. In the end, we spent a year living full-time with their dog and our granddaughter Kelsey. Although I adored Kelsey, I never knew how to connect with her. She was twice skipped forward in school and graduated from high school at the age of 15. Her intelligence was much beyond the genius level. She bonded with Roy since he was the only person who could truly relate to her. Their eyes and hand motions could carry on entire conversations. Roy offered to pay for college because their finances were in disarray following the divorce. I was unprepared for it. When the recession hit and Roy lost his job, we went through a difficult time. Although he didn't particularly enjoy work, the pay was good. Just to have something to do, he accepted a job at a nearby plant operating a forklift. He received a promotion really swiftly. He was soon back in his office, performing his expertly performed duties. At that point, the deck incident took place. Even now, my greatest shortcoming is how easily I misjudge my partner. We used to have a house in the country when Junior was little. There was a wood stove insert in the chimney that we occasionally enjoyed, especially on really chilly days. It reduced the cost of heating. I was going shopping on Christmas Eve. Roy pointed out to me that he was watching a woodcarver show and mentioned that he had always wanted to give it a try. It was so unusual for him that I found it hard to believe. He was never one for tools. All he had to buy on an as-needed basis were the necessities. I laughed and told him there was nothing he could do like that. Roy now becomes a voracious researcher on anything he finds interesting. He attempts it once he believes he has learned everything possible from the research. He fails from time to time, but not often. He is usually successful. When I went home, I was so amazed by the sculpture he had produced that I even suspected him of purchasing it. He took a seat and carved me one more figurine. Years later, he made the decision to construct his mother a deck. Yes, he had experience working with builders, but the most intricate thing he had ever built was a dog home. I made fun of him once more, but when it was all said and done, it resembled a piece of art more than a deck. Three stages, fully customizable. Mom was quite pleased with him. I was miserable. When he refused to construct one like that for us, I even lost my temper. Honey, my mom's house sits on a slope. Our lot is flat. I'd have to make the top section level with the roof to get the same flow. Even though I could see he was right, I harbored resentment toward him for years after that. I was almost 60 years old and still suffering from menopause. I was experiencing minor aches and creaks and was generally depressing myself. Facing my own death made me furious, and I vented my frustrations on Roy, the only person I could. I couldn't stop myself from hating myself occasionally for the way I treated him. I knew in my heart that he loved me enough to tolerate it. Sabrina became mad at me for it because it was that horrible. What are you doing? You know Billy can't stand to be around you because of the way you treat Roy. He doesn't like me being around you, afraid it'll rub off. I love you honey, but one day you're going to push him too far. She avoided me for a while after I, of course, became enraged. Finally, I became foolish enough to push him past his breaking point. For the most part, none of us was interested in continuing the debate. I could tell by the look on his face when he thought I was not looking. He was comforting in a sinister manner. Roy glanced up at the television as I was relaxing and enjoying a romantic movie. Hey, I just saw a news segment on that writer. He's worth over 60 million, all from writing romance novels. It was effortless for me to say, it's too bad you don't have the talent to do something like that. I knew that I had hurt his feelings. 
How hard could it be? Boy meets girl. Love ensues. Something happens to keep boy and girl apart. True love wins out in the end. Money changes hands. I can't quite recall what was said after that, but considering my state of mind, I'm sure it was offensive and concluded with the traditional you can't do that. I'm aware that over the next several months, he spent more time on the internet, but I let him be because he was always looking up something that piqued his interest and stopped him from pestering me. One night, he gave me five thick binders. What's this? He smiled. It's the romance novel you said I couldn't write. Oh no, I didn't remember that. I threw it carelessly onto the coffee table because I was unable to give him the pleasure. I'll read it later. Right now there's a movie I'd like to watch. He remained there for several weeks until all of a sudden it vanished. Kelsey then approached and discovered the binders. She informed me how amazing it was once she had actually read it. Her eyes had completely changed the way she was seeing Roy. He and she had always been closer than anyone, even her parents. Her eyes were filled with complete hero adoration at this point. She was, as I mentioned, frighteningly intelligent, so there had to be some merit to it if she felt that way. I made the decision to read it but was unable to. She had duplicated it in school by that point. When that individual called Roy about his book, I was taken aback. I assumed that would be it when he declined to do business with him. Roy had just reached his breaking point at that point. One night, when I was venting about some trivial matter, he lost it on me. After I recovered from my shock, I was enraged with him. It was the first time in years that dinner wasn't on the table when I got home the next day. It was like the last straw when I realized he had eaten something I didn't particularly enjoy. I had reverted to my previous habit of complaining about my personal life. It felt like it had happened before. The doctor was more of a presence than an attractiveness. Before long, we were sharing a lunch together while I vented about my made-up problems. He was adept at knowing just what to say, when to say it, and how to turn it all to his benefit. I was still enraged by Roy's seeming lack of logic and in denial mode. I was feeling the strain of suppressing my emotion, and I had no one to talk to. I finally ruined our marriage beyond repair. While I awaited approval and the security check, I rented a condo. After six weeks, I finally had a new address. With pleasure, I peered at the walls. I would have him bowed down. I felt in control because I stopped communicating with him when I didn't want to and he had no idea where I was. It all came crashing down at this precise moment. Roy's response was not at all what I had anticipated. I reasoned that nothing could break the marriage as long as we were apart. I clung to the belief that Roy's would have to put up with everything I did as long as I returned home because he loved me. I was hiding while on vacation. He found me in just one week. It took me entirely by surprise. I had lightened my hair two shades and shopped for younger, chicer clothes. I didn't feel close to 60, I felt 40. The girl appeared to be a high school student. I assumed she was one of Kelsey's pals when she surprised me by saying my complete name. She gave me a manila envelope after I gave her my word. You've been served. Sorry. And then she was gone without warning. I was incensed when I saw the documents. Separation by law. Just to get my thoughts straight. That garbage. My rage increased when I discovered my phone was dead when I took it out. My service has been cancelled by the man. How could he have known? By God, I'll impart some wisdom to him. And I gave it my all, roughly a hundred tries, before realizing he wasn't going to pick up the phone. I tried calling him at work, and he hung up as I got through and started screaming. When I called back, the receptionist answered. She was aware of who I was and made it clear that she would not return my calls if I put her through anything and I wasn't polite. You can't call him on company time and harass him, Sheila. Just try talking, maybe he'll listen. I gave it a go, and we had a conversation. It was more like a rant to me. I should've listened to him when he stated that if he found out I was seeing someone, we were over and there would be no more talks or explanation. But I wasn't feeling that powerful or haughty at the time. I guess we all know how that turned out. After I told Randy, Dr. Feldman, what he had said, he devised a scheme in which I would leave the condo and he would ride three stories ahead before descending again and opening the door for me. He just strolled by and repeated the elevator ride, not bothering anyone on the floor. We felt we knew so much. We would never have imagined that he would employ detectives. There wasn't much bonding. It never lasted very long because he was nothing like as physically fit as Roy was. Yes, I was let free, but I believe that was more due to my desire to spite Roy than anything else. I had no one to turn to when Roy changed the filing to a divorce and my whole world fell apart. When I opened the envelope at the nurse's station in the hospital, I had no idea what was inside. When I noticed that I was standing in the doorway, flashing Dr. Feldman with the words while my robe was open, with the words time expired scribbled all over the picture, I realized my life was gone. The photo fluttered to the floor as I passed out. When four nurses and a doctor noticed them, the hospital was completely covered in them by the next day. The doctor was enraged. I informed him that it was tough crap at this point. For the remainder of his tenure there, we avoided one another like the plague. It took me several weeks to fully realize how much of a mistake I had made. I was so close to a nervous collapse. A couple more of my friends, including Sabrina, kept an eye on me. As one of their own, Sabrina booked a complete physical, and they went into greater depth than normal. 
I discovered that I had multiple hormone issues, one of which required medicine to balance, and that I also needed to take drugs to control my blood pressure because it had gotten so terrible. I was diagnosed with a minor case of obsessive-compulsive disorder after additional physiological testing. The drive to control other people was one of the various ways it may show up. That came with a separate pack of medications. I was greatly benefited by all of that and treatment, but it was too little, too late. Then Roy simply vanished, leaving even Kelsey in the dark about his whereabouts. Our only addresses were that of a business and his attorney. I was positive we were over, but I held out hope for counseling, believing if I could just talk to him, he would listen to me and come around. Even though we had a meeting before the counseling, all I could manage to do was apologize and cry. The entire set of meetings was a farce. I had the impression that our therapist was a little terrified of Roy and didn't like him. Instead of ignoring me as I had assumed, he completely botched everything I attempted. The therapist discovered that I had essentially done the same thing and that I had somewhat altered the rest of our past. There have been occasions when, as I've been talking to the therapist nonstop, I've noticed him smiling a little bit. At that moment, I understood he was probably enjoying my pain, which is why he had agreed to the sessions. Naturally, we went to arbitration after the counseling contract expired. Roy was very giving, so the poor man must have believed it would be an easy stroll in the park. I battled valiantly for every small object. I was taken aback when we received the financial disclosure. From where did all the money originate? I was unaware of Roy's occupation and knew that he had left his previous employment. The facts were revealed. My Roy, the accomplished author, the rising star of the romance genre and best-selling author. I had overheard nurses discussing him. Even his paperback had been laying about. All along, it was him. He was also prepared to offer me more than half. It was quite close to a million bucks with the house. My lawyer almost had a heart attack when I turned down the offer and insisted on absurdly high alimony. Roy's eyes changed in a way that caught my attention. He no longer appeared amused. After a brief conversation with his lawyer, I noticed her smile for the first time. If you reject, we'll let arbitration expire and you may sue us in court. Take it or leave it, this is his last offer. He'll also throw in the profits from the first two volumes for the next three years. I'll tie you up for years, and they'll never give you what you're getting now. My daughter is going to college next year, and my fees from this alone will pay for it. Please refuse. I'll battle you like a crazy dog over every point. At that moment, I realized it was useless and it crossed my mind that he could be amusing himself by watching me aimlessly bounce through hoops. I went home, sobbed uncontrollably, and accepted the terms. I was crying when it dawned on me. I kept missing how intelligent he was. He became more subdued as a result of his mother raising him without much male influence. Sometimes he thought like a lady. I recall an instance at his previous employer where he was being severely mistreated by a different management who was also trying to ruin his career by taking credit. After being grumpy for a while, he eventually returned to smiling. With shame, the management departed. Roy was having a lot more alcohol than usual as he celebrated. I remarked on how fortunate he was. He chuckled and told me all about the methodical methods in which he had destroyed the man, in ways that had nothing to do with him at all. Then he explained what he had done to the man as he was leaving. Thoughts of him venting to impress me crossed my mind, but the hairs on the back of my neck continued to stand up. The settlement itself was a contemptuous gesture. Money was never really important to him, and my mocking remarks allowed him to brag about his accomplishments. He was three quarters of the way through his fourth book, which I was unaware of at the time, and he already had another one scheduled for publication. He even gave me credit for initiating his new career by dedicating the third book to me. His words were only known by those who were next to us. I once saw his house. He was on a book tour, so Kelsey drove me up to see it. It was exquisite. Admiring the vista, I peered across the cove to the vacant lot that would someday become my home. I didn't quit my job in spite of the promotion. Since I got to perform more actual nursing and less administrative work, I actually appreciated it more. Just the first year was terrible. Not as horrible was the second year. Things were going well in my therapy. Though I did go out to dinner twice with a doctor while Roy had to travel out of town, I never strayed during our marriage, contrary to what Roy believed. I have no idea why I did that. My therapist believes that I required confirmation that I remained attractive. Through counseling and physical activity, I managed to stop using my blood pressure medication. Observing a 70-year-old effortlessly perform the most difficult poses is how I first learned about yoga. Based on her well-defined physique, I estimated her age to be in her late 50 seconds. She chuckled and explained that it involved both exercises and covert surgery. Once I started her class, I couldn't stop. Five times a week, I went. After a few weeks of nearly screaming in agony, I started to push myself more. I lost my belly roll, toned up, and gained a lot of self-assurance. I made use of my situation to get some treatment done on my neck. I like how my instructor looked, so I quit coloring my hair. Since it was more silver than gray, I purchased shampoos to make it more reflective. None of this went undetected. Men in their late 40s were asking me out on dates. Unfortunately, I had pretty much given up on it. It was my 62nd birthday. 
My retirement program, I-401 and the money Roy gave me put me just north of a million dollars, not including Social Security, according to my financial advisor. I gave up my job. Kelsey arrived to spend the weekend, complimenting my new appearance and sense of independence. What are you gonna do now, Grandma? To be honest, I had no idea. You should move up to the lake. I know you like the area, and you'll be close to me. At the end of the year, she was scheduled to graduate. It would take her two months to turn 18. She was definitely pursuing a master's degree, if not a PhD. Roy would pay, I knew that, and if she would let me, I would help. She was genuinely in love with her new partner. As soon as she became legal age, they were moving into an apartment together. He was every bit as brilliant as she was. When they were around, I sometimes felt like a bug under a microscope. I gave it some thinking. The house was all that held me here, and I could rent it out until the market stabilized. I also enjoyed the lake. To be honest, I hadn't planned on living next to my ex. Really, simply put, the offer was too excellent to refuse. Furthermore, I found it appealing to imagine that I could design the home of my dreams and be the first to occupy it. Kelsey was quite supportive, but she cautioned me a bit. I don't know how Grandpa will react. He doesn't mention you, but keeps a picture of you on his nightstand. I asked why once. I loved her for 36 years altogether. Almost all of them were good. I keep the picture to remind me of happy times. Then he grinned at me and to remind myself never to get stupid enough to marry again. When she talks about him, I sometimes feel like she's trying to torment me. It seemed as like he was making up for lost time when he began dating. Kelsey wasn't on board. He thinks I don't know, but he beds most widows and divorced people over 50, but he has dated as young as 39. Hey, he's rich, attractive, and in excellent form for his age. He's not a moron, but some people are gold diggers. I hope he would exercise greater caution, as illnesses can strike anyone at any age. She referred to it as his platinum woman parade and complimented me on my new hairstyle. I'd let it to regrow to my college length. My house was ready at last. I had a mini housewarming with Kelsey. She could take a 900-yard pontoon ride instead of driving nearly 5 miles to get to my house because it's in a separate development than his. Roy still didn't know that I lived there, so she took action. He saw you the other day, while you were doing yoga. Didn't get a look at your face, though. He did say you had a hot body for your age. He wanted to invite you over. I'm stalling him off until his birthday in two weeks. I'm giving him a little party. I questioned her about how on earth she convinced him to attend a party when she knew he wasn't fond of them. Grams, you know him a lot better than I do. Nobody makes him do anything unless he wants to. I pretty much begged him, in a teasing way. The day arrived. I spent the whole day being a tense ball of energy. I plan to arrive tardily so that he may have some time to unwind with his pals and enjoy a few drinks. He hadn't communicated with me in person since the split. On my birthday and Christmas, I received cards and gifts. Though Kelsey was largely unaware of them, he signed them from Kelsey and I, I followed suit. I covered my wavy hair with a scarf for the journey across the cove. My hair was all over the place as Kelsey opened up the outboard since she was feeling wonderful. Since sound travels very well across water, I heard his lawyer ask if he had met me yet while I was docking. No, she's probably a dog. Trying to get the hair out of my face, Kelsey charged up the yard with me in tow. Grandpa, you know how sound carries over the water. She heard what you said. You need to apologize. After removing the hair from my eyes, I extended my hand and looked directly into his startled face. I said, hello, I'm Sheila. Woof. When he took me home, I was much happier than when he had let me stay. After a very delightful little romp, he went to sleep, and I broke down in tears of joy. Though I felt like I had to almost beg him to stay, I was still shocked that he did. I gave it everything I had to please him, enhancing the experience with kegel exercises and yoga poses. It lasted quite a time, but it wasn't tantric. He gave it his all, setting the pace and pulling back when he got too close. He was unlike the others, he was more forceful, both grabbing and caressing. It took me some time to understand the difference. He could be that way since he was free to go out if I didn't like him, as he wasn't required to live with me. Though I did wish he would occasionally be gentler, I did appreciate his new manner better. Sometimes, I hoped, there would be more. After speaking the next morning, we agreed to split ways amicably. I told him how wonderful his writing was and how pleased I was of him. I told him about my life after the divorce as well, including my OCD and hormones without getting too personal. He's with me nearly every day. I purchased a powerful little boat that is rather lovely. While she's there, Kelsey and her buddies take it and fly across the lake. Every time, she returns with barely enough fuel to reach the marina. He's still punishing me in numerous ways. Occasionally, he advises me to remain at home, even when nobody else is around. And when I knock on his door, it better be life or death if he's in his office working. Every few weeks to a month, he goes to the country club and retrieves a cougar to bring home, even though he knows it irritates me. At his birthday celebration, I got to know a few of those women. I let them know I was serious competition, but I wasn't foolish enough to try to claim him by clutching his arm or sending any of the other many signs one woman gives another. I have even gone to the extent of using powerful binoculars that I purchased specifically for bird watching to see them. 
After noticing the flash once, he reached for his own pair, turned to face me, and waved a bit, the female flailing about all over. That day, I smashed a really nice pair of binoculars. I walked inside and sobbed out of sorrow and regret. I was the only one responsible for him being this way, I had done this. Usually, I would pout for a day or two, then drive over to his patio and practice yoga behind the privacy wall. I was really awful at leaving my leotard behind. Usually, I would jump around two-thirds of the way through my workout. That allowed me to work out different muscles. When he summoned me over for breakfast one morning, I was quite shocked. He had a woman over the previous night, I swear. Just as we were finishing our first cup of coffee, Sabrina entered wearing a robe. As I moved from one to the other, they fell apart at the expression on my face. She gave me a hug. Surprise. She looked fantastic without the robe on. How? Why? What about Billy? A veil lifted from her countenance. Billy was just marking time until he vested. Then he and his little honey he's had on the side for five years were going to disappear into the sunset. The day he retired I had him served. At work, in the middle of his farewell party, I included lots of photos for him to share. Hope I didn't ruin it. In exchange for a peaceful divorce and no alimony, we divided his retirement 60-40% in my favor. Roy and I went to lunch after I ran into him. After a few dinners, we had breakfast at last. Please try not to get angry. I was, but there was nothing I could do about it, so I let go and we lounged on the patio like old friends, the surrealistic atmosphere returning to my existence. We had just had an intense playdate, and I was basking in my afterglow when he gave me a shocking blow. You know, you and Sabrina were close for years as roommates in college. Curious, were you ever? If you were, I wouldn't hold it against you. We could perform a three-way, sort of flashback. That'll never happen. I snorted. That is not possible for you. As soon as I said anything, it struck me. With a simple smile, he said, you know better than to say that. My comment, he should have dropped her to the ground. If you betray me, run. She did it twice. I fail to understand why she's still around. You guys agree. Comment down below, sub and bell and I will catch you in the next one.